Hey everybody, this is Vanessa, Mike, and Chris from the Hideaway Homestead. And today we're doing our first kitchen table talk. And this is probably gonna be a, a series that we do every so often where we're just sitting around the kitchen table, having a conversation with you all, and talking about topics here for the homestead. Uh, we're gonna be talking about things like land clearing, uh, animals, uh, maybe some of the craft work that we're doing in the, in the workshop here. Um, just various things that might be of interest to you all. And we, we need to discuss those things and plan and work towards them anyway, so we wanted to include you in the conversation. If you're new to the channel, please like, subscribe, and share. That really helps support us and our family. Um, and it also is helpful because once this gets out, a lot of people can come in, chime in, and help, help guide us a little bit. We're new, we're new to the whole homesteading thing. We've uh, we only bought this uh, house and, and the land within the last couple of months. So Vanessa's gonna kick us off uh, with some topics that we've uh, kind of handpicked. Um, one of which is gonna be clearing land for the garden. So this is a garden that we're gonna have for our family, I think later down the road, we might have a market garden somewhere here on the, on the property. Um, but this is really uh, something that we're trying to get spun up. I think a pipe dream, but I think it's obtainable as we would like to be able to make enough food for the whole family for the year. Um, but Vanessa's gonna go ahead and kick us off. So right now the area that we wanna clear out, like Mike said, is between our two homes. Um, it's in our, what we would consider like our zone one or even almost into our zone zero uh, for the permaculture areas. So it's very accessible for us to go in and get food um, when it is in season and for us to go out and maintain the soil and um, keep everything as it needs to be. So I'm not super familiar with like permaculture. I know at a high level there's like zones, right? And you're supposed to, I guess, decide what you want in your zones. Uh, and the closer the zone is, the it's easier to maintain or... Right, like, so if it's an area that we need to go out to every day, say farm animals that we need to tend to every day or multiple times a day, or going out to water the garden every day, you're gonna want those zones much closer to you or those items much closer to you in those closer zones. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about this a little later. But you had ideas about the animals, right? Like you don't want them too close you don't to want the them house. too close to the house. Um, I guess zone one and two are the closest, but it's the easy easiest and accessible for both houses. Um, like the garden is going to be uh, located between both of the dwellings. Uh, it is accessible uh, from. I guess the north and south side, uh, we do have a, a slope that uh, heads down towards the creek that we can utilize in some other fashion. Uh, the other side of the uh, roadway uh, on the north side of the uh, property uh, also has a sloped uh, incline, but it is very accessible for having, I guess, uh, Pigs or, uh, or hooved animals, um, pigs, goats, and maybe a couple of milking cows at some point. Um, it could be opened more. Uh, we will talk about that uh, a little bit today. Um, the underbrush is quite thick, um, like you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, there's um, a lot of brambles and thorns, and more thorns <laughs> and more brambles. So we think that the brush and the uh, kind of the weeds and the, the uh, sticker bushes that, that exist around the property so thickly are because several years ago a tornado actually came over the hill or over the mountain here and uh, actually hit the house and, uh, and hit Chris's house and it you know snapped a bunch of the top parts of the trees off. That opened up a lot of light that hits the bottom of the forest floor and it promoted growth and unfortunately it was the wrong kind of growth, right? You end up with a lot of um, sticker bushes. So we, we want to get some of that stuff cleared out. Uh, so it's accessible for us to take some of the trees down so we can open up some of the area. And we'll talk a little bit more later, with, again, with regards to some of the animals that might be able to help us with that. And the plan is with the brambles and the thorns and everything that we pull out, um, 
we want to be able to burn that, but there's some stumps that are still in that area that we need to clear out too. So we'll probably try to burn those and the stumps at the same time to get that cleared out and um, probably use that in some areas, the ashes, uh, as like a type of fertilizer and, uh, for some of the plants around the homestead that need it. And then a lot of the saplings and the branches and stuff, uh, we'll be mulching those and chipping them and by the time we're ready for the actual garden next year, then we should be able to use those in the vegetable garden to help out. Um, what, what else was there? Well, I think we uh, did want to talk a little bit uh, about the size, right? Because again, we're kind of trying to think through this and saying, hey, there's the three of us. We, we have our two children. We've got um, some animals here already, two, two dogs, a cat. I mean, how much space is needed for a family of this size to facilitate and kind of have a um, substance substantial amount of food for the year right to get us through a year and the, and you know and if we have some surplus great that's stuff that we can can for extra and we have long term um so do you know like how much space we're actually going to need so roughly on average it's about 200 square feet per person um between all of us there's like five of us so probably a thousand square feet preferably i would probably prefer like to do raised beds so we're going to need a little bit of a larger area than the thousand square feet and then we will be fencing that area and we have a lot of deer in the area turkey rabbit there's a bear so we definitely need to be able to keep them out of the garden or we're not going to have a harvest at all yeah we don't want to uh, have a grocery store here for the whole <laughs> mountain right it wouldn't be good <laughs> Um, so that's cool. Okay. Uh, did you want to tell them a little bit about the container, uh, garden stuff that you're doing right now? Like, and again, we went kind of small this year because we were, you know, just small. getting here. Yeah. Small is difficult for me. <laughs> um, but we have some collards here. We'll be planting those probably in the next week or two. They can be planted about two to four weeks, I believe, before your final frost. Um, and then we have some marigolds and some violas and things that we'd like to plant around our fruit trees uh, to help with the pollination, try to keep some of it, like the rabbits and things like that away from the bark so that they don't have issues. Um, we've got some tomato, paste tomatoes growing and then we'll probably, we've got peppers going, forgot about those. And then we'll probably get some regular summer uh, plants going like squash and green beans and whatever I can get them to Be agree okay to. With. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll probably we have some old containers, some old buckets with drainage holes, things like that we'll have to utilize this year. Yeah, and something else that, you know, that's important to note, there were already several fruit trees here on the property. So the prior owners have, um, two uh very mature or two or three very mature uh pear trees here at the property and then also several uh, mature peach trees uh, there was a uh, mature apple tree here but it was uh, very diseased something had gotten a hold of it so we ended up having to cut that down um, when we got here and then chris has uh, several uh, peach trees uh, that are um, saplings still, but that are over near his house too. And he, he, one of the mature peach trees are just down the hill from him. I'm I'm excited. I'm hoping that we can get some baking pears. We can get some pe I, You know, I love peaches. Um, might even be able to do a little fermentation and and get some um, adult beverages mm -hmm. out of the uh, out of the fruit trees too, which would be great. But the nice thing is there, there's a balance, right? We're actually getting um, a lot of bees that are here at the house. I mean, already with the trees that are in bloom, that's gonna be great for the garden. So let's talk about clearing land for animals. There we go. <laughs> um, so as Chris had alluded to earlier and what we were talking about with the different zones, we've been thinking about animals here and, and Chris will kind of explain some of the conversations we've had just and again we're just thinking out loud at this point we're doing some research and um 
if you want to go ahead and let them know. Um, well, we are still doing a lot of research um, on different types of uh, animals, what would be best for us long term, uh, what would produce the most amount of meat in a uh, situation to you know feed five or more uh, people. We, I guess we've discussed a little bit about uh, which each person would like to have, uh, chickens, rabbits, a couple of goats maybe, a couple of pigs at some point. Uh, I've suggested that on the land clearing side of the conversation, uh, goats and pigs would be uh, very, very helpful. Uh, it would be one of those things where goats love brambles, thicker bushes, thorny, very uh, rough and tough uh, vegetation. Um, they're built for it just like a cow. They have the uh, four valve stomach or four, I'm not sure, you might have to comment down below, but their stomachs are rough and tough. Uh, they're fermented pouches, I think they're called. Uh, their mouths with the weird, uh, real strong flat teeth, just like with pigs. Uh, they root around, they till up the soil themselves. They take and eat almost any vegetation, uh, more on the sweet side for a pig, uh, but the goats would uh, eat the uh, and rambles very easily, no problems. And we can, um, it's actually good for us, right? We could move them around quite a bit early on. Mm -hmm. And uh, do, you, do you know how long it takes them to like clear an area? Is it like a quick turnaround time or is it like a couple weeks or? I would say depending on the maturity, say of a pig, um, you could do a 12, or I'm sorry, 20 square foot little enclosure, let them in there for, you know, a few weeks, uh, move them to another location, uh, or you could do where the goats would go in, say a 20 to 30 yard, or yeah, 20 to 30, yeah, sorry, not feet, yards. Do a uh, 20 yard little fenced in area, have the goats go in, eat all the brambles, Get the vegetation down then we rotate them to another section and move the pigs in right. the pigs eat the rest of the vegetation and they can till up the soil for something up, uh, later down the road gotcha. and then can't um, we bring like chickens in and all yes the chickens would help with the fertilization right. uh, with keeping the bugs down um, the the goats would eat some bugs, but it's more of they're eating whatever's on the vegetation. Gotcha. Whatever the plant has on it, they would probably take care of. It's not like they're going to go after a bug like a chicken would. And that's something we've been talking a lot about too, right? So if we get chickens here, we obviously want to get like boiler chickens and laying hens. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do, we, we feel confident that we can let them free range a bit and just put them in the coop at night. Right and they would be fine. Um, we have a lot of open space here. So there's, uh, like Chris was mentioning, there's, you know, there, or I think you mentioned this, there's a lot of rabbits and there's oh, a lot of, yeah, quite a few rabbits. Yeah, so I mean, we feel like predators might be a little bit lower up here at the house for now. So we feel, we feel pretty confident we can let the chickens out. That would help uh, significantly with like flies and ticks and, you know, st uh, stuff that's here at the house that we're, we're kind of dealing with um e even with our dogs we're, we're constantly you know pulling ticks off of them and um we've been thinking about guinea hens a little bit too but um the downside of that is, oh, well the upside is they're a lot better with the bugs right so they'll go through and really uh take care of bugs but they're a lot louder they're uh, a lot noisier um don't need that especially with the kids and, <laughs> yeah the kids are noisy too <laughs> yeah. so um but you had mentioned kind of zones, right? And I, I know we had talked about like, uh, it's kind of a balance of how easily can we get to the animals mm -hmm. to take care of them, you know, day to day and thinking further along, right? Like winter, you know, I mean, we're, we get a lot of snow up here. Um, so being able to do that, but then also not having them too close to the house because we, we don't want, uh, all the noise we don't want all the any smell i mean we'll try to keep that down anyway maybe they'll just drown each other out <laughs> um so yeah chris has been doing a great job doing a lot of research on it um trying to trying to figure out what's the best approach we're thinking like easy to maintain animals to start off with um i had mentioned rabbits uh, i feel like rabbits are 
a very beneficial animal, right? They're they're kind of low maintenance. They uh, they produce fur. And again, none of us own a loom or anything, but might be something we'd be willing to try. Anyway. Right. Um, so that you know, they produce the fur. They uh, they actually produce a cold fertilizer. So that's where you can use their um, poop essentially to go out and immediately place on uh, um, plants without having to worry about it like burning them, like a, a chicken. A chicken's fertilizer, you actually have to let it. Um, it's a hot fertilizer, and you have to let it uh, you, you know dry out and <laughs> before you can use it. Otherwise, the uh, nitrogen, too much of the chemicals in it will um, burn your plants and, and just destroy them. I mean, it's either that or you would need to put that on when your garden's not in use, essentially. Right. The off season. Yeah. You know I mean? so Get it in the soil. Either in yeah. the spring before a, few, a month or two before you're ready to plant, or then in the fall when you're done. Yeah. Right. If you all have any good resources on the, like the animals, like which ones you feel in order are the easiest to maintain for new homesteaders and any suggestions you have around the permaculture for the garden or for the animals, we'd love to hear your uh, suggestions. Uh, just leave that down in the, uh, in the comments below. Um, that would be great for us and as we're really kind of appreciate it. Yeah, as we're kind of looking through this stuff. So what's the next thing on our agenda? All the animals we'd like. Oh, so we actually covered item four already. To an extent. Number five, time management. Boy, this one has been a struggle. <laughs> so, I uh, we, we all have our full time jobs during the day, right? So Vanessa uh, here with the kids, uh, homeschooling, uh, things of that nature. I have a full job. Uh, so does Chris. You know, full time during the day. It has certainly been a struggle, like managing time to make sure we're getting all these activities and really moving the chains down the field, right? Making sure we're keeping the goal, the goal moving along. I think in, ad in addition to the learning curve of learning all these new things until you get into the routine of, okay, I know how to do this. I don't have to go research it before I go do it. And even even this, right? So doing the videotaping and the the audio and like doing the whole social media thing. And, and prior prior to us buying the house, uh, we um, we were not super social people. So we were trying to you know it takes us out of our comfort zone a little bit. But we're trying to learn how to do the video edits. And there and there's a there's a lot of time behind that too. Um, you know that we're realizing. And kind of making that balance, and then plus, you know, with the kids, we want to be able to spend enough time with the kids during the day and uh, in the evenings. So it has definitely been uh, challenging. I think uh, personally, for me, what's been helpful is having a clear schedule, saying that you know we're going to do certain, we're going to post videos on Thursdays, we're going to do certain things in the morning and the evenings and just having that very clear schedule and i i know it's only going to increase once we start having the uh, garden and the animals and um so something i would like to see if you all have any suggestions on like how to automate things on the farm or you know um like water irrigation hey here's easy ways to collect rainwater and have it automatically irrigate your garden for you so you're not having to deal you know deal with that like any of those kinds of suggestions would be great too uh, again if you could leave your comments um, definitely would appreciate it uh, that's kind of been my impression with the time management I know your situation's a little bit different uh, Chris is still living up near the city where it's but you're gonna have your own time management things you're gonna have to make a balance of like how do I you know get things moved getting settled in you're kind of going to be doing the same thing we were doing you know several yes. months ago it's all a transition and we're learning as we go uh, like you were saying that you know at some point we're not going to have to research something before we do it I know that's down the road but you know it's, I, I mean we'll always be researching oh, things yes. but not like every little thing yeah. we need to oh. do and it's, it feels more like a marathon and we don't want to uh, make it so much of a race like we don't want to 
I don't want to turn around tomorrow and hey, surprise, you have five goats, <laughs> ten pigs, <laughs> twenty well. you know chickens. Uh, you know, it's, it's really just, hard to reel it in though when you're like, I really want to go and do this right now. <laughs> yeah. So, topic six that we had listed here was going to be our lumber mill. Mm -hmm. So, very recently, as of this last week, we bought a wood miser lumber mill. Uh, and it'll probably be about 12 to 16 weeks before it gets here. Uh, there is a lot of forest on the property. So it's 32 and a half acres here. And I think we only have an acre of unforested land. Uh, so the, the nice thing is, and there's a lot of mature lumber, especially down the uh, ridge behind the house here. Uh, not the ridge where the uh, tornado had kind of come over and, and hit a lot of stuff. There's a lot of younger stuff there. We felt that uh, collectively we, we needed to get a sawmill here so that we could uh, really, I think 80% of that's going to be posts, uh, boards, um, things that we can make animal pens out of, uh, maybe even just repairs here at the house, right, if, if things are going on. I think then like, I don't know, 20, maybe uh, maybe 30% of the lumber mill or the sawmill operations would be furniture based yes. or crafts based. So I've been doing woodworking for a long time. I, you know, I do furniture, I do fine woodworking, I do uh, a little bit of everything. I do carpentry work as well, you know, construction work with it. Uh, so I definitely wanted to be able to utilize the mill in a way that we could do a little bit of everything right and also kind of being mindful of some of our hobbies which may even you know turn into something we could use to bring some income uh, here to the house what are your thoughts about the sawmill you, you want to tell them a little bit about like location just kind of like what we were thinking yeah we do that. Um, like you said it would be very uh, useful uh, down the road for things around the uh, farm the repairs to the barn uh, making lean-tos for you know having lumber to be dried out uh, firewood um, pretty much uh, almost anything we could think of you know come to the point where like I think it would be a really good idea to have one so we scouted the property you know, a couple of times uh, found a few locations uh, the options that we uh, come up with for uh, different uh, mills uh, or uh, lumber processing uh, locations. Um, we wanted to have the easiest of access to the best or the oldest uh, standing lumber that we could find. Like you mentioned earlier, the um, one side of the property where it's, uh, the, the tornado came through Mm -hmm. A lot of young saplings, so once again, more underbrush. On the other side, quite a few large standing uh, oak. You said there was a couple of maple down there mm -hmm. that we've noticed. Um, the creek, there's a creek nearby, which is nice. Uh, a lot of uh, flat, open areas that we can set up shop and get things situated. A uh, few dead standing pieces, uh, we can utilize those for firewood. But uh, once again, ease of access, there is a couple of paths or a road access between both of the houses and across the back side of the property. So we we're going to try to utilize that as much for getting lumber in and out. Um, so the property actually has a lot of red oak. Uh, like Chris was mentioning, there's a lot of maple. There's a lot of walnut here. There's some cedar, there's some uh, sycamore, especially when it's closer, a little closer to the creek and the water sources. And there's a variety of birch uh, around the property as well. So there's certainly a lot to select from. We would, uh, oh, and there's tons of pine. Um, there's just tons of pine around this area. We would use things like the pine, uh, you know, stuff like that for the animal pens. The hard lumber, like when you start thinking about oak, and you know, and an oak makes great furniture, right? So does walnut. It's a very uh, nice uh, accent to any work, woodworking piece that you're doing. So there's definitely a lot to do there. And I, I did like how you mentioned the uh, firewood, right? Because we, 
we're going to be going through a lot of firewood here. Uh, the first video I posted was us cutting firewood. I've done a, a video log about uh, the wood boiler. It's super efficient during the winter time for us to have that running. It feeds both houses. Goes through a lot of wood, right? I think, uh, and I don't remember where, uh, but I remember hearing like a family of our size with the two houses, it, we were gonna be going through about, I think 10 to 11 cords of wood per season. And the reality of it is you need to have that much seasoning while you're going through what you have. So coming into this fresh where we're at right now and to be completely transparent here, we're at zero right now. We went through all of our wood supply uh, by the end of the season. We're looking at 22 to 25 cords of wood, which is a lot. Um, and if you're not familiar with what a cord of wood is, it's about a eight foot section that's four foot wide, four foot tall. And that's neatly stacked. That's not hand tossed, you know, loose, loose stacked. That's neatly stacked wood. So is that about um, like a truck load and a half, like a standard size truck? Or? It, it depends, right? So if it's loose tossed into a truck, you have to mound it up. And then, yeah, you could get a cord, right? But if you neatly stack it in a truck, you can actually get a cord if it's It'll be a little bit higher than the truck bed or, you know, to the, the sidewall of the truck. Um, but yeah, so you're talking about 22 of those. Ima imagine that like 20, 20, you know, 22 of those sitting out there. It's a lot of wood. And the nice thing is though, with the wood boiler, you want to have um, some of that split and we have a splitter. You want some of it in logs. And like Chris was mentioning, there's, there's differences, right? We have the smaller, less mature lumber down the down the side here, but then we have the larger here in the back. And we do still currently own property elsewhere. We own about eight and a half acres right. over on the other side of the uh, mountain. It's a little bit driving distance, and maybe we go up there at some point for some lumber. Uh, but in short, to kind of wrap up uh, item back six to here. The sawmill. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a sawmill coming. That's going to be fun. Right, we're going to have to put that together and, and really get it in place and start utilizing it. Um, wood is very important for us here at the homestead. It's, um, it's one of the reasons why we selected this location as well. And we want to make sure we're doing it in a, um, in, in a sustaining way, right? I think like at some point we need to be making sure like as we're cleaning up all the dead lumber and stuff that's already fallen, uh, maybe going in and planting things for future future use. We, we actually, um, I had heard this from someone and it was actually a really good idea about going out and like creating groves of certain kinds of wood. And that's something we can probably check also with our local uh, forest department or our local extension office. And they're very good for resources for that. And I believe you can go and um, the forest department will actually give you go through your area and give you plans of what you could do to keep your area forested in the way that you want it to be. Yeah. All right, so we are on to our outro here. So I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Um, Vanessa was gonna kind of go over a couple of items yeah. around. So, yeah. Those that you um, that have already watched us a few times probably already know um, we are trying to get our videos out every Thursday and they vary. Some have been about homesteading, some have been about uh, the workshop, but if you could, um, if you like and subscribe, you should be able to sign up to get a notification, I think, uh, every time those videos come out. Um, you gotta click the bell. Yeah, click the bell. So yeah, like, subscribe, comment, share. Any feedback that you can give us is helpful. Uh, let us know what things that you enjoy seeing, or if you have any suggestions of things, maybe we just haven't uh, figured out something. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And social media, we're on uh, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, so you can find us there, and those links will be down below. All right. Well, thanks. If you like this too, let us know. We're, you know, we, we're definitely um, interested in making sure you're at the table with us and, uh, you know, 
we'll go from there. Exactly. Thanks again, and it was good seeing you all. Thank you. Have a good one.